Today's episode is sponsored by my friends at the National Ranching Heritage Center in Lubbock, Texas. The National Ranching Heritage Center on the campus of Texas Tech University tells the story of ranching in the American West through over 50 historic structures. One of those structures is Hedwig's Hill Dog Trot House. Hedwig's Hill Dog Trot House was built in 1855 by a man named Louis Martin. Louis Martin was among the first of some 7,000 Germans who traveled to the hill country of Texas in 1844 as part of an agreement between the government of the Republic of Texas and German officials. Martin worked as a wagon freighter and trader, acquiring wealth and prominence in the German community that grew rapidly in the new state. A man of political influence, Martin served as sheriff of what was then Gillespie County. He also sold goods to nearby Fort Mason. In 1853, Martin moved his family to the north bank of the Llano River, where he operated a general supply store and built a house naming the location Hedwig's Hill for his mother and for his daughter, the first white child born in Fredericksburg, Texas. In 1855, Martin bought several sections of land in Gillespie County. With it, he purchased for an additional $1,200 cattle, oxen, other livestock, a wagon, farm equipment, and household items. Records indicate that he is the builder of his second home, the Dog Trot-style house now known as Hedwig's Hill Dog Trot House. You can see Hedwig's Hill Dog Trot House in person at the National Ranching Heritage Center in Lubbock, Texas. You can check them out online at ranchingheritage.org. Come experience real ranches, real stories, real heritage at the National Ranching Heritage Center in Lubbock, Texas. I'd like to start today's show with a quote from West Texas writer and journalist Elmer Kelton. Elmer Kelton was a friend of today's guest, and this reading is from the prologue of Kelton's 1973 novel, The Time It Never Rained. It crept up out of Mexico, touching first along the brackish Pecos, and spreading then in all directions a cancerous blight burning a scar upon the land. Just another dry spell, men said at first. Ranchers watched water holes recede to brown puddles of mud that their livestock would not touch. They watched the rank weeds shrivel as the west wind relentlessly sought them out and smothered them with its hot breath. They watched the grass slowly lose its green, then curl and fire up like dying corn stalks. Farmers watched their cotton make an early bloom in its stunted top, produce a few half-hearted bulls, and then wither. Men grumbled, but you learned to live with the dry spells if you stayed in West Texas. There were more dry spells than wet ones. No one expected another drought like that of 33, and the really big dries like 1918 came once in a lifetime. Why worry, they said. It would rain again this fall. It always had, but it didn't. And many a boy would become a man before the land was green again. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is Jimmy Powell. Jimmy Powell is a 94-year-old rancher from Fort McCavitt, Texas. Jimmy is a third-generation rancher who is highly regarded for his wise use of natural resources and conservation practices. Jimmy has served as president of the National Wool Growers Association, the Texas Sheep and Goat Raisers Association, and the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. 
In 2002, Jimmy was a recipient of the National Ranching Heritage Center's Golden Spur Award. And in 2016, he was a recipient of the Foy Proctor's Cowman's Award of Honor. I sat down with Jimmy at his home in San Angelo, Texas, and recorded this interview. Here's Jimmy Powell. I'm James L. Powell, 94 years old, and I ranched in West Texas all my life. My grandfather was reared in Tennessee, a member of a group of five brothers that came from Wales and and, the British Isles. And uh, he came as far as Tennessee. The others, I think, remained in the New York area. And his uh, family was reared in the, in the, in Tennessee. And my grandfather decided, I think he was one child of five, and uh, he decided he was going to come with uh, to Texas. And he and his father came to Everman, which at that time was South Fort Worth. Now it's part of South Fort Worth. And he went to grade school there, and my grandfather running steers on the farms there to uh, fatten them or to gain, have, have them gain, and he'd sell them. And they passed the Homestead Acts at that time. And he decided that'd be a good thing for him to do, so he took his steers to West Texas, where they were uh, homesteading quite a bit of country. You you lived on it five years and put water on it, and he took cowboys with him, I think, two or three, and agreed to support their families for five years if they would transfer the property that they were homesteading to him at the end of five years. That would give him a piece of property of 20 or so sections that he could sell as one ranch. And this was the business that he decided to undertake and stayed with it for about 20 years. They ended up in New Mexico because they could need New Mexico state property. And they could also, at the time lease New Mexico state property that wasn't being homesteaded as well as federal lands joining and make a pretty good size operation uh, 30, 40,000 acres by homesteading in those locations and that's the reason he moved to um, Roswell, New Mexico to do that. He was still running steers at the time he did that, but the cars came out, Model T. Up to then, he'd been riding a horse everywhere he went or going in a buggy. And he knew the man that he saw driving this Model T, first he'd ever seen when he was in Roswell. Asked him how he got that car. Said, I'll ride 40 miles when I go to the ranch, and I can sure use that car if it's going to run like I see it running. And this friend of his that had the Model T told him, says, pal, if you'll just get rid of those steers and, and buy some sheep, he says, they raise two crops a year, one wool and, and one lamb. And he says, you can buy one of these cars in one year if you you have a good crop of sheep. He did that, and he did buy a car as soon as he had enough money. I think it was a little over a year, though. And um, 1918 came along, and it was the coldest year in New Mexico at the time, and he was homesteading land at the base of a mountain and leasing some of the state land up on the mountain running a sheep, and he accumulated about 3,000 head of sheep. Had herders, every 1,000 head. And he had to start building bonfires to keep those sheep from freezing to death. It got so cold. 
and uh, he told Dad, who had been uh, enrolled in NMMI, and in those days they had the last two grades of high school and first two grades of college in that university, and he was in the university port. But Granddad told Dad he was going to have to quit school and take care of the sheep because he was going to Texas where it's warmer and get some property, and they were moving from New Mexico, which he did. He came to Snangelo and found that uh, Wilgore Central Storage was making loans at that time, and they'd just taken a ranch from a rancher that was leasing it because he failed to pay his lease at the time, and that's what they did. So he bought that ranch, and it was in Crockett County, and wired Dad to ship the sheep to Big Lake where they had built a railroad and it had ended at Big Lake. So it was only 25 miles to the ranch, and he knew he could unload the sheep and drive them that open range from Big Lake to the ranch, which he did. And when they shipped the sheep got to Big Lake, they had been crowding those bomb fires to stay warm in New Mexico, they sends their wool, and they were all black except their face. And it was a sight, Dad said. People come and see those sheep before they went to the ranch, and they stayed in the corrals at Big Lake, I think, about two days. And he said he met a lot of the people in the Reagan County and Crockett County. That's where he lived until he married mother who was um, a family with a family in, in Sutton County Sonora going to school and uh, they married and uh, went to the ranch in um, Crockett County it wasn't long until oil was found in that part of the country I think they uh, found it first on university land at Texon and that was drilled by a fellow who'd moved to rig in and was going to a location, but on the way he got stuck because it had been raining so hard and the mules couldn't pull that rig through that mud that takes on, so he started drilling there and it happened to be on university property. And he struck oil about 2,000 feet. And that was the beginning of oil in West Texas and the the ranch that uh, Granddad bought was about 30 miles south, just at the Crockett and Rigged County border, but in Crockett County. And the Humble Oil Company came out and with their geologists, who were land geologists, they looked at the land to determine what might be underneath it. I don't know exactly what their training was there, but they came to this ranch and uh, offered Granddad a, a good bit of money to to buy the minerals. Now, keep in mind, this was new in the oil business. Nobody knew much about oil. So... It was such a good deal, he thought at the time, that he did. He sold the minerals to the ranch. And uh, with that, he bought two other ranches further east and more productive land, Fort McCabot, Menard, Sonora. And that's where I grew up, Fort McCabot. I was on Menard County Ranch when... Uh, but Dad and Mother moved out there, and, and uh, I was born. And about a year later, we moved to, Fort Mc, uh, to, to uh, Sutton County. And then, after I got out of school, I, I went. I went to Fort McCavitt. After I graduated from Rice and served my time in the Navy, got home, and uh, that's where I've been for. Um, to about nine years ago after I'd married and had a family and moved back, back up here to Snangelo. Now, 
I had gone through school in San Angelo. I moved from uh, Sonora, first grade, to San Angelo into the second grade and through high school. Well, I can remember when I was in high school, my grandfather and grandmother moved to San Angelo to be with uh, their two children. My aunt had moved here also, and my dad and my aunt were here with their families. And granddad liked to go to the ranch, and he'd always want me to go with him. So uh, I did in the early days... Uh, go to the ranch and in the summertime I'd go out there and stay the summer and and work. At that time we had screw worms uh, which since we have seen a, a sterile fly program develop and screw worms have been eliminated from the United States. It's now uh, clean all the way down the Panama Canal and they're keeping the flies from coming in from south with a unit today that uh, distributes those sterile flies and kills the fertile ones that come in from the south. So we uh, really did enjoy that program because it saved us about 7% of our livestock, which we lost to the screw worms or they were made unproductive as a re result of cases of screw worms. We also had, in the sheep, we had uh, stomach worm, and they were always being uh, uh, dosed to um, stay healthy. Now, our cattle were a little bit different. At one time, there was a tick. And it had been uh, eliminated, and uh, today, and, and at that time, we sprayed them to keep keep the ticks off, and also the flies, the screw worm flies. The screw worm flies gone, and the ticks now are carried cared for in the cattle business with sprays. It's made that business a lot easier. Made the sheep business a lot easier uh, with the technology that's been developed. We lived on the ranch during the war, of course, World War II. All the youngsters that were working on the ranches had to go to the service. They were drafted if they didn't join and the only ones that were left, only youngsters that were left, and that, by that I mean under 35, I think they had a draft that would take every uh, male that was 35 and under if they hadn't joined the service. So when the youngsters left the ranches, uh, my father had to hire high school boys, mostly seniors in high school, especially if they had their own saddles, and he'd he'd supply the horse. And um, I had a horse. I started working livestock with my father at six. Uh, when I was age six, I worked livestock all through the war from 41 to... Uh, 46 or 7, about 6, 7 years, we had to supply our help with the high school kids or men who had been rejected because of health conditions. And we had a couple of men that we could hire a day that way. But up until then, we were working uh, sheep and cattle every day. Uh, 24 hours a day, <laughs> it seemed like we'd get up at daylight and go to bed at dark. We didn't we didn't spend much time. We'd go to uh, go to church. We dad and mother wanted to go to church and did, and they took they took us. And my grandmother was a, a staunch 
churchgoer also, and so I sure I sure attend a lot of church. Still do. It was a, a good experience for me. I still get up early and I still work all day. At the age of 92, I, I do try to take a nap after lunch. Don't often do that, but I can still get around pretty good. I guess that hadn't hurt me at all. We would round up horseback, and then uh, we get to the corrals. We worked the sheep. We shared them. We cut the tails off the lambs, vaccinated the lambs for for sore mouth, rounded up the cattle, vaccinated the calves, and uh, castrated the bull calves, made steers of them. So we had quite a bit of groundwork to uh, once we got the, the, the animals in the corrals, but the, the biggest item was rounding up the livestock in the pastures. Our pastures, uh, some of them were, I don't remember of any of them being any smaller than two two sections, and we had some that were six sections and some that were ten section pastures. So we, when we gathered, we had to have more than two horses to take care of that number of livestock. Uh, we were stocking, I think, about fifty animal units to the section. So we'd, we'd put together quite a few cattle in a pasture and, and quite a number of sheep. Uh, it just depended on the, the feed. If the feed was better in other parts of the country, we'd move our livestock to where the feed was better. And sometimes we got dry all over and had to sell, sell down our livestock. Nineteen. 50s uh, was one of the fish periods that we had to sell about 60, 65 percent of our livestock and got and got so dry. It started getting dry in the 57. It never really ain't uh, rained much until I guess about five years later. We we had to burn prickly pear for the cattle and the sheep and the deer. We didn't have many deer to start with, but uh, we we encouraged their growth and we were under a game preserve established by the state to increase deer growth. Uh, I don't know how many ranchers went into that program, but I don't think there were too many, but we were in it, and uh, we grew a pretty good crop of deer after about five or six years, and still still lease our country for deer and turkey, quail, dove. That's all part of the ranching program today. It's amazing to sit down with a man like Jimmy Powell, who is 94 years old and grew up under the influence of his father and grandfather in the ranching business. Jimmy is a living link to the men and women who settled West Texas, and he carries those old-time values with him. I asked him to talk about what kind of men his father and grandfather were. They were honest people, and they treated everybody that they knew and their friends as as honest people. They never worried about uh, people not meaning what they say and being honest about what they say. Uh, I, I must say that 
that has changed some since um, I was reared in uh, early, late 30s, early 40s. Granddad never did ride horseback as I knew him. He was still a healthy person at the age that, that I got to know him well when he was well over 50. And uh, my dad taught me how to ride a horse. He rode with me all through the war and for some years after that. And I rode horseback until I got to be about, I guess, 45, 50 years old. And the screwworm program, sterile program came along and and didn't require as much horseback riding as, as as that program did. So we had opportunity to do other things, which I did. And we had uh, people that we could employ to do the, the, um, the, the work that needed to be done that, that I didn't do or that my dad didn't do. So... The ranching business has changed immensely. We did uh, a couple of things in the sheep business when we started. My father and, and granddad did, and and in the cow business also, as we got uh, more mature in the in the ranching business. For one thing, the sheep. In the beginning, were uh, woolly and wool grew over their eyes, and my father determined that their face should be open and and uh, grow hair rather than wool. And he found a herd of sheep in uh, Montana that he's able to buy into, and he brought to Texas, and he found some bucks with the kind of open face he wanted in New Mexico in an Indian tribe. And he bought a few bucks and started improving the sheep from that uh, point so that uh, today uh, all of our sheep are open face. They can see their way to to water. Uh, They can see their lambs. After they've grown wool over, would have grown wool over their eyes. I think they're larger animals because they forage better, and they're selected for that purpose also. In the cow business, uh, we have always had Hereford cattle, but the uh, Hereford, actually, the cattle that you. Uh, raised for food product, normally known as um, Angus, Hereford, or Shorthorn, which were, were all part of the English uh, cattle business. And uh, the English used them particularly for for eating, the, the fatted calf dinner was well known in those days for the noblemen. And if there was a, an undesirable meal uh, offered friends that had been invited over, then normally the female would be killed and sometimes bull in England. And those cattle were imported over here, and they're still some solid, pure breeds of uh, Herford, Angus, and Shorthorn. But in many cases, they have been crossed with uh, cattle from the continent, uh, the European continent. And all of those cattle were used as beasts of burden. They, they pull farm implements and trailers, and they grew a lot of uh, muscle and mucus in their meats, and uh, the the meats were not really very tasty, nor were they tender. 
as were the Angus, Hereford, and Shorthorn. That's still the case in this country, and uh, we we see a, a lot of the crossbred cattle that have the beast of burden bred into them, and, and they're tough. They're not tasty. They have to be seasoned a lot, uh, and and I think they're taught, uh, the people in this country are taught to season beef. They, they really don't need to if they have Hereford or, or Angus or Shorthorn uh, purebreds to eat. Our interest in improving the cattle was to place uh, more ribeye and quarter on the, on the animals so that you had a bigger percentage of healthy food product to sell when you sold the calf, and they were fed feedlot and slaughtered. And today I think you'll see that the ranchers throughout the, uh, the, the nation are raising really uh, fine feedlot cattle, uh, especially if they're purebred Angus, Hereford, or Shorthorn. And that has been a development, in my opinion, that has occurred in my lifetime since I've been raising cattle to the extent that it's only happened about 20, 25 years ago where beef has become so de- so much in demand because of the taste of it and the uh, condition of the meat and they've learned how the uh, wives have learned how to cook it also they also have figured out that they don't have to have all the seasoning that they've been told that they need and we're constantly trying to improve sheep as well as the cattle and other smaller items Jimmy Powell served in the United States Navy on an aircraft carrier off the coast of Korea from 1952 to 1955. When he returned home, he began his ranching career. I did. Uh, Dad asked me what I wanted to do, and I learned to play golf in uh, college. And I, I liked it. And when I came back, I told him I just had like to rest a little and play golf for a month or two, and that's what I did. Then I went to the ranch and and started working, and then I got married. Pretty soon after that, and started raising a family. And, I was given responsibility in the ranching business. Once you have responsibility, you have demand for for work and time required. So I I did what I needed to do. And I, I didn't do much playing around. Didn't have a chance or didn't take a chance. Did you ever think of pursuing something other than ranching, or was that always your main interest? Well, I, I had enough knowledge of the ranching business to feel very confident that that I could become successful as a rancher and see some improvements that could be made. When you get older, you start thinking about things like that. You get 24, 5, 6 years old, you start thinking about things like that. At the time that I got out of the service, I guess I was 25 or 26, and I had thought about some things that could be done in the ranching business that would be helpful. And I had no other interest in any other kind of uh, enterprise, especially if I had to move to town. I was 
happy in the country, uh, quite free. Uh, I could read as much as I wanted to at night. I'd read sometimes until I went to sleep, but I I never read over past 10 o'clock, I don't think. <laughs> well, one thing that ranchers will finally do, I think, if they don't do it soon, is um, fix your pastures with enough water so that the livestock don't have to walk two or three miles to water. You have more water on your property. They'll walk to water. If they don't have to walk long, they don't lose a lot of weight walking. Uh, that's an energy that requires weight. They won't make so many trails on the on the pasture. More grass will grow, and they'll also, I think, decide to fence their pastures so that they can be rotated in and out of, and briefer have briefer periods of grazing, so that the grasses will return to their former condition in a short period of time. And that way you'll actually grow more grass and you'll be able to to graze more livestock. It, it, it just works that way. It takes a, a little financing to do it, but if you're doing it over a period of time you can take a small percentage of your income annually to put water in and fence and once you've got it set up your rotation programs then are easy to implement your livestock will actually get used to being transferred from a grazed pasture to an ungrazed pasture which is like going from hamburger to uh, dessert because the, the ungrazed pasture has fresh grass in it and they know it, the livestock know it when they get in there and once they've gone into the, the fresh pasture uh, they'll realize they're going to do that over a period of time. I think we'll all find out that livestock are a lot, a lot easier and smarter uh, a lot easier to handle as a result. I've, I've experienced it. I think your calves would be bigger. They'll have, not necessarily in frame, but in, in weight. Uh, they'll probably, when you ship them, uh, weigh more than they normally would. And they'll continue to have that heavier weight. And as you improve your range, their weights will increase, and that will increase your income. It's just a question of how much do you want to do, how much will you do, how dedicated are you to the actual ranching business, or maybe some other things that take the place of ranching. Every person has a different idea what they want to do, and some will be dedicated ranchers like that, and some won't be. They'll all be able to make a living. There's no question in my mind about it. Those that can't make a living, they're not going to stay in the ranching business very long. And it's no, it's no big deal. You just got to think about it and work it out and then stay with it if you're really certain that it's going to work for you. In talking about his ranching operation, Jimmy once said this, The operation has become successful as a result of segmented management practices. These involve range management, which is control of noxious plants and non-beneficial trees and bushes, management of livestock through genetic selection and production records, 
management of the range with a high intensity, low frequency grazing system patterned after one I saw in South Africa. South Africa, a good bit of that's desert country. Has a lack of rainfall and has uh, forever. But I saw a 30 section ranch cut, cut into and livestock transferred every 14 days from one pasture to another and they were stocking a little more per acre than the average in the in the area which means that the average in the area was stocking all they possibly could without having to buy feed for the livestock so it will by rotating from a grazed pasture to an ungrazed pasture, realizing how much time the livestock and how many animals you need to put in to a pasture at one time, how long to graze them, when to rotate them, and what's the vegetation and determine if you have too many and maybe it hadn't rained as much as you would normally realize you might have to s reduce the large number that's rotated and, and you have to make a decision you have to do it in South Africa they were doing it just like that. They had grass growing on, well, it's more grass than I saw in South Africa while I was there. They had it growing on their pastures. Uh, the grazed pastures, I think they grazed down to not shorter than four inches. Most of that was uh, mid grass, very little running grasses. It was native, but they knew what they were doing, and they let those grasses grow back. If you graze those grasses down to the ground, where all that's left is root, well, they don't get the sunlight necessary to grow. So you got to leave some of the grass above ground so it has the ability to take in the uh, environment above in order to grow. There was no question in my mind that, that what they were doing was something I could do and have done. Now, I'm not sure how dedicated those that are coming after me are in that respect, but as time goes on, I hope that they'll finally realize that it, it's a good program. And we still need to have more water on our ranches. We might decide to put it there someday. The government's tax program, income tax, but more especially a state tax, has caused me to utilize the uh, bookkeeping necessary to transfer property uh, without the unnecessary taxes that will be uh, levied on me if I hold it till death. That's I've seen families whose uh, owner owned the land. He was a father. He he passed away. And in order to pay the estate tax, they had to sell a portion and sometimes all of their ranch land sell to pay the, the estate tax. That's a part of government that's entirely unnecessary and should be changed. Uh, and I worked for many years on the congressman 
appeared before the committees, Ways and Means Committee, trying to get some of that done, and I got some of the numbers changed so that they weren't as difficult. But the, still, the tax exists and can be raised any time that the wrong attitude arrives in the Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Finance Committee. Those problems, they need to be thought about by a lot more people than think about them today, in my opinion, because those politicians up there are not thinking about it. They're going to end up seeing ranch land owned by corporations if they don't watch out. And when you have a corporate structure, you may not have the type of thinking that's detailed to the extent it's necessary to, to produce a, a beneficial product and the amount of money necessary to, to decide that you've made a profit. If that happens, you're going you're gonna to have some of that land move into either probably larger corporations. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope it's still... Our lands in agriculture still stays in private hands. I think you'll get more benefit out of it. In an essay about the Powell family and their ranching operation, in a book entitled Texas Cattle Barons, Western writer Elmer Kelton wrote these words. They see agriculture surviving because it must. Mankind has always needed three basics, food, clothing, and shelter. Elmer, Elmer was really a good man. He was really honest. And uh, when I was President of the Texas Sheep and Goat Raiser Association, the magazine was uh, owned by a fellow by the name of Phillips, and at that time we thought we we should own the magazine, and and we were able to buy it from Harm Phillips. And at that time, I asked Elmer to take the magazine and and put it on a progressive basis on a paying basis and he agreed to do it and he, he ran the magazine for uh, four or five years and really made a good magazine out of it he, he uh, had greater interest in writing books I think than he did in news reporting but he was an excellent news reporter for instance he learned that my dad had problems with um, rigs drilling and um, and using their water in the open pits, and the open pits were leaking into the fresh water. And that was migrating down to the roots of the live oak and killing the live oak and draining into the draws that run into the rivers. And he reported that to the Railroad Commission, which controls the oil companies. And they told the oil companies, get that fixed. And that's all they told them. And they didn't fix anything. So uh, Ursula Lupton was the family lawyer, and Daddy was talking to him about it, and he says, well, let's just sue the Railroad Commission and see if we can't get that fixed. They need to shut those pits down because they're running fresh water from here all the way to New Mexico border with open pit. So they sued the Railroad Commission. First time the Railroad Commission, I guess, had ever been sued. It's, it's one of the most powerful agencies in the state. And they do a good job, but they wouldn't take care of the oil companies. Well, they won the, the, the suit. My father and Ursel did. As a result, 
I believe one of the major issues that appeared before the public was an article that Elmer Kelton wrote after he had gone with me to the ranch to see the fresh water that had been polluted by these pits. In one pit, we found a hole in it that had been drilled in, and all companies were releasing water down that hole. How far, I don't know. But it was going into the, the uh, channels that had fresh water and polluting the fresh water as it drained underneath the ground down to the next windmill that was pumping it out of the ground. It was red. That article was red. And there was quite a disturbance about it. And I really think the Railroad Commission read some of those articles during that uh, suit that Herschel and Dad had with them. And as a result, I think it helped Dad Herschel win the suit. And as a result, today we have no pit orders as a result of that suit. And in order to take care of no pit order, the oil companies have decided it's just best for us to carry tanks out there and put the material in it that is causing this damage. And we haul it off and we have a disposal area for it. And they empty those tanks there now. Well, Jimmy, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to visit with me. Thanks for sharing some stories well, with me. I'm just happy to do it. I, I would like to have been a better informant than I am. <laughs> I'm not sure that I've taken time to think back as well as I should have to answer your question. Uh, I'm always thinking about what I wake up in the morning wondering what I'm going to learn today. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Jimmy Powell for taking the time to visit with me. I'd like to thank the National Ranching Heritage Center in Lubbock, Texas, for sponsoring this episode. You can find out more about the National Ranching Heritage Center at ranchingheritage.org. I'd like to thank my friend Hal Cannon for playing the Cowboy Crossroads theme music. You can find out more about Hal at halcannon.com. I'd like to thank my Trail Boss patrons, Bob Kelly and Chris Ryden, for their support of this episode. If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cowboycrossroads. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cowboycrossroads. You can also make a donation on my website at andyhedges.com. Com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads.